Um, well, good evening and uh, a very warm welcome to everybody here. Thank you for coming to this meeting at the uh, Frontline Club. Um, I think we're going to have a very interesting discussion this evening, and I hope that um, we can devote a lot of this meeting to questions from people who've come to the meeting, because I think many of us have got interested, uh, questions that we're interested in, and um, I know that Alex and Marina will be very happy to answer as many of those questions as they possibly can. Even for those of us, uh, those of you maybe, who are familiar with the, the strange world of espionage and intelligence agencies, the events of last November must rank amongst the most macabre and bizarre in British history. According to the British police and their investigation, a former FSB officer, Mr. Andre Lugavoy, traveled to London and during a meeting at the Millennium Hotel, managed to spray a concoction containing a deadly radioactive substance, polonium-210, into a cup of green tea. Within weeks, the person he was meeting, Alexander Lignenko, also a former FSB officer, was dead. If, on the other hand, we are to believe the Russian authorities, who have refused to extradite, uh, extradite Mr. Ligovoy, it was actually Mr. Litvinenko himself who was responsible for killing himself with his own poison. Mr. Litvinenko's death has caused a major diplomatic row with the usual flurry of tit-for-tat expulsions. As well, for many people and for many specialists, uh, a major reassessment of what has been happening to the Russian state throughout the Putin years. And within this story, there are many, many other stories. The first is the personal story of Alexander Litvinenko himself and his wife, Marina, who's here tonight to tell us something about the background <coughs> to her husband's murder and also about much more recent events, events in the last few weeks, in fact. And second, <coughs> excuse me, there are events that have been taking place in Russia and in particular, the rise of Mr. Vladimir Putin to the presidency of the Russian Federation. Alex Goldfarb, who first met uh, Sasha Lipnenko in Russia while working as a director of a project to tackle TB within the Russian prison system, and who subse subsequently arranged for his escape from Russia via Turkey, and who brought him to Britain, is Marina's co-author for the book here, uh, Death of a dissident, which I hope uh, some of you at least have had a chance to see, and which is on sale here at the front, and uh, both the authors will be able to sign copies of it um, when this meeting is finished. The book is full of extraordinary details uh, on the background to the story, uh, which involves a much larger cast of characters, several of whom are in the audience <laughs> tonight. I must say, I particularly enjoyed the story of the meeting between Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Putin that appears to have taken place in a broom cupboard at the back of the latter's uh, FSB office in the Lubyanka. However, it is one light moment in a very dark story which is still being played out and which involves many other murders, including, according to Mr. Goldfarb, the state-sponsored murders of more than 100 innocent Russian citizens in the so-called apartment bombings. We at the front line are particularly proud to host this meeting tonight, as it was here in October last year, just before he was poisoned, that uh, Sasha Lipinenko addressed his last public meeting, speaking about the murder in Moscow of the great Russian journalist Anna Polikovskaya. So without further ado, I'd like to, first of all, introdu introduce Alex, um, who will speak to us about the um, background to this book and the process of writing it and the issues that are raised within the book. Um, I then propose that we move straight on to ask Marina to speak um, about more recent events. And after that, we'll open up the floor to discussion. Um, I'll talk to you further at that point, but if for now, we can give the floor to Mr. Alex Goldfarb. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so uh, this book has several stories in it. The most uh, important, uh, from my standpoint, story is why Sasha was killed in the first place. Because uh, when all is said and done, and when all the evidence is on the table, and when uh, all the information, which we still don't know much of it, uh, but once it becomes available, uh, the question will still remain why. The police knows how, they know when, where, who, uh, but it's still not clear why. And in the official line uh, that is uh, presented now uh, to the public, and I'm sure um, which is backed by uh, sufficient evidence, Mr. Lugavoy came to London, produced some polonium, and put it in that cup of tea. Uh, it's obvious that Mr. Lugavoy didn't have any motive to kill uh, Sasha Litvinenko. He didn't have access to polonium, and he uh, actually couldn't have been a hired hand because he is quite a rich man. By some estimates, he is worth $30 million, his company, his security company. So he couldn't be hired uh, assassin. Uh, uh, so, and the book tries to answer this question, why? Uh, as uh, um, the, the, the obvious suspect is, of course, that it's, uh, it's a Russian state, the state-sponsored assassination, but why the Russian state would uh, go to all this trouble and particularly use this uh, bizarre and unheard of uh, weapon, murder weapon, weapon, the um, radioactive element polonium-210. So, and the book, as we try to write it, actually contains three interconnected uh, uh, stories which, uh, to, when combined together, uh, uh, try to answer this puzzle. The first story is the personal story of Sasha and Marina. And it's approximately a third of the um, narrative. Um, and how they, being uh, in, the, in the scale of retrospect uh, understanding, being an ordinary people, were caught in this extraordinary situation. The second part of the uh, uh, book, the second story, is the story of personal relationships, uh, relationship between uh, Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Putin, the two people who by the, um, in my view at least, uh, by the uh, scale of passion uh, and uh, passion between them, the stakes in money and in power between them and the uh, uh, the latest chapter of this gruesome murder, uh, really the, their saga, the two of them, their uh, conflict, both personal and political, reach uh, Shakespearean proportions. Because Sasha died as uh, somebody who was between these two people. Regardless of which theory you pick, the British, uh, our theory, let's say that he was murdered by the Russian state at the orders of Mr. Putin, as he himself, Sasha himself, said in his last statement, or whether you believe the Russian official th uh, theory uh, or uh, semi-official theory, which is promoted by the government-controlled media, that Sasha was killed by Berezovsky in order to tarnish Russian image in the world. So that's the second part, the uh, relationship between these two individuals. And the third part is, of course, the uh, recent history of Russia, uh, starting from the collapse of the Soviet Union and ending with what we have now, the emerging uh, energy superpower, if, as they themselves uh, call themselves, uh, and um, uh, the central part in that recent history, which is the backdrop to the relationship between the individuals, is, of course, the war in Chechnya, 
which uh, was not the cause but the catalyzer, uh, in my view, of uh, major uh, events with the country and with the individuals who are part of this story. Uh, well, and um, of course there is another personal element because it's a way to explain yourself. Like uh, Bill Clinton said in his memoirs, everybody who is over 50 has to sit down and write a few pages for, um, you know, for children and grandchildren to explain what the hell you did with your life, your own life. So for me, it's uh, kind of also was a personal um, exercise to do that for the sake of my children and grandchildren. So I think this I'll stop and wait for the questions. Thank you, Alex. Marina, would you like to take the discussion on and just uh, talk a little bit about more recent events? And the first, good evening to everybody, and thank you very much to be here. Actually, I never expect to be here and speak in front of people because it wasn't my business at all. I was one half of our family. Everything what Sasha did, I support. But I never went to speak with people like Sasha did it. <coughs> And I never read any articles. And again, I never expect one day I must do it. And even when it happened, and I received some offer for interview and write this book, I wasn't sure I'd like to do it because all this pain and all this feeling of loss, it was mine. And I wasn't sure I'd like to share it with anybody. But then I understand it's very important. Because it wasn't just political accident or murder of dissident in London. It was a very nice person who was killed. And probably just me can explain how he was good. And I agree, I will do it even it's still be very, very painful. And to be honest, it was big pressure. Every time it was saying, Marina, we are not sure it's going to be one day this in a court, and even one day somebody will name it who kill your husband. But I, I trust to British authorities because I stayed in a very close contact with Scotland Yard, and I saw how these people worked. And I started to understand I'm real British here, and I support it by British government. And finally, what happened just two weeks ago here in London, and all what saying by British government, and what it was asking about extradition, and support by new prime minister, and support by French president and German chancellor, everything I started to understand is very serious, and never any relationship between Russia and England can't spoil this case because it's very serious. And to be honest, when I received all this news, I said I'm very proud to be British. Maybe first time in my life I understand how is important life only one person for whole country. And I'll try to do everything what I already done for this book and to safe memory of Sasha, because I don't like one day our son, who is 13 now, 13 years old now, will ask me, Mama, what is the reason was for our daddy to do it, why he was killed? Maybe it's better to have simple, quiet life. We went from Russia, we escaped from Russia, we could stay here just quiet and safe. Why our daddy did it. And I don't like he will ask me, he should understand. Sasha couldn't stand a part of what happened. And again, this book it will help people to understand exactly maybe why Sasha was killed. Thank you very much, uh, Marina. Um, I'd, now, <clears throat> I'd now like to open up the, the meeting now to questions. Please feel free to ask any questions. Please keep your questions comparatively short. We want to have as many people asking questions as we can. Um, the gentleman here will offer a microphone to everybody. So um, can I see a show of hands? Gentleman here. 
It is known that um, Alexander didn't feel safe. Uh, he knew that he was at risk. Why did he uh, decide to meet somebody like Lugavoy? It's a question too, yes? Actually, it wasn't only meeting with Mr. Lugavoy when it happened. And he met Lugavoy uh, in the beginning of 2006 in the birthday party of Mr. Berezovsky. And actually, he knew Lugavoy many years before. But he met after our, our life in London just first time in uh, January 2006. And because Lugo will still be in a circle of Mr. Berezovsky and other his partner, he decided he's not a dangerous person to be. And because Sasha started to develop his, maybe not business, but new job, he decided it will be useful to have contact with Mr. Lugo. He didn't expect any dangers, maybe, from him. Gentlemen, I'm just intrigued about the method of assassination of your husband, Marina, by a volatile substance called polonium 210. It seemed to me the less obvious method of killing anybody with a substance that could actually kill everybody who came into contact with it. I just don't understand how Lugavoy is still alive in Moscow. Can you please explain? Actually, uh, I will ask Alexander Golf to help me because it would be maybe a more professional answer. It's a, it's a very technical issue. Uh, to begin with, uh, polonium is uh, not uh, your usual uh, source of radioactivity which uh, is used Mm, by hospitals, let's say. So it, it emits a particular kind of low energy particles which do not penetrate a skin or sheet of paper. And therefore, they cannot be detected by normal Geiger counters, which uh, is used by hospitals to detect uh, radioactivity, let's say in diagnostic tests, which is used by the police it's not the kind of radioactivity which is, you know, uh, is um, emerging from a bomb or from Chernobyl. So this sub uh, kind of radioactivity is undetectable but normal, by normal techniques. And one of the reasons, uh, this is one of the reasons, probably the main reason, why polonium as a source of, uh, of uh, poisoning was not discovered by the authorities until half an hour before Sasha died, and that is on the 23rd day of his illness. That is, they checked for radioactivity in two hospitals several times, they saw nothing. The police was around for the <coughs> last 10 days, they saw nothing. It took them uh, to, ta uh, to take the samples of Sasha's blood and urine and bring it to uh, the British Nuclear uh, Center in Old Marston, right? And run it through special uh, equipment which is only available there to detect it. Uh, once they found it, the source, then they used special uh, counters, uh, detectors not available normally in the police or in the hospitals to trace this polonium back as we believe to its source and to find the trace that the uh, uh, Mr. Lugavoy and his uh, uh, friends left around London on the planes and so on and so forth. So one of the reasons is that uh, those who did it uh, believed that this would be a perfect murder, a method uh, because it leaves no chemical trace, uh, this poison, it cannot be detected by normal techniques and that is one reason. The second reason why, so it was not used with the intention to create this radioactive scandal. It was used to create an impression of unexplained death. And had Sasha taken two more sips from this cup, he would have died within the first week. And nobody would ever have even think about the radioactivity because the first symptoms was the symptoms of normal food poisoning 
And it's only on the 20th day when his hair started falling out, they started thinking about radioactive things. So, as I said, polonium kills you from inside. Once it's absorbed into the body and gets into every cell of your body with the body fluids, it destroys DNA, but it cannot be detected as radioactivity. That's number one. Number two, because we believe now that they have used it before. That means the labs that are developing this, um, Oh, yes, another aspect of why I use polonium, because it has never been mentioned before as a murder weapon. It's not available on the black market. Terrorists have never heard of it. Law enforcement have never heard of it. Uh, it cannot be bought or sold. It simply didn't come into the detective's mind to look for something like that. So it's an additional factor. And uh, we believe that it comes from, and it's actually short-lived. The half-life of polonium is three months. So within a, a few years, there will be no traces left, even radioact by radioactivity, even if you know what, where to look for. So we believe that there are at, there are at least two suspicious deaths in Russia uh, in the recent years where polonium has been used now in retrospect, one of a Chechen um, figure who was a fighter, uh, one of the fighter leaders who were captured by the Russians and died in custody, and another of a security um, businessman in the security business from St. Petersburg who had in the past association with Putin. At least uh, these two people died with similar symptoms. Um, so that's all we know about it. But as I said, the idea to use polonium probably came with the objectives for it not to be found. Gentleman with the uh, Hello, uh, David Wallace, the Press Association. Um, it seems we're in a bit of an impasse at the moment, and uh, I just wondered what you hoped was going to happen to end the impasse in terms of extradition uh, and how that would happen and what you actually think is going to happen. Well, we are of two minds here. Yeah, so we, I we think are a team, but we've got opposites. We have, opposite we, I am much more of a pessimist than this and Marina is more of an optimist in the sense that Marina believes that eventually with proper and again, maybe, yes, maybe I repeat, but I say it. And first of all, it was saying relationship between Russia and England is more important than even life of your husband and what happened in London. But I said, no, I will wait. And first of all, it was named Bulgovoy. And then was asking about extradition and diplomat level. And now how it's happened, you see, is this exchange for diplomats in London and Moscow. And I still believe it's not finished yet. It's going to be something. And of course, not change of constitution of Russia. Nobody asked to do it. But it was just asking to be civilized, civili civili how to say it? Civili civilized. Civilized Sorry. in this democra democracy world about Russia. And I believe something will happen. Alex has different opinion. Yes, I, uh, again, I was, I must admit that I was not, I was very skeptical from the very beginning. And I thought that the, uh, Britain would never impose sanctions uh, uh, on Moscow for all, for many reasons which are more or less obvious, but it happened. And uh, the reason why I believed so was that everybody understands, as far as I can think and uh, know from what experts tell us and from the sheer common sense, that this is a government-sponsored uh, assassination. And Mr. Lugave would never be uh, let to uh, stand trial in Britain because he'll talk. Not because of the Constitution or legal process, but simply because he'll tell where he got polonium and who sent him. As I said, he had no motive and no access. So they would rather kill him than um, let him be extradited. So it will be some sort of a tie. And I still believe that uh, it will not be resolved in the near future 
for the same reason, because uh, <coughs> Sasha named Mr. Putin as the one who ordered this assassination. He had no objective basis for this. He had only sense, a sense of uh, how things work there. But given the fact that uh, polonium is produced by the atomic uh, ministry and the transfer from, of this amount of polonium from one agency to another needed an interagency approval if it was a government sponsored job the, the leads go to the at least to the Kremlin administration FSB by itself would not be able to get hold of polonium and it's short lived it's not something from the old Soviet stockpile it has to be produced fresh. Russia is the only 97% uh, of world polonium is produced in Russia in the um, particular nuclear facility, former weapons lab. And uh, so it's clear that the, he would talk. For that reason, he would never be extradited and let's stand trial. Unless. Uh, the more pressure you apply, the more they will kind of dig in and will not do it. So the only chance, in my view, uh, whether this can be uh, resolved in the court of law is when Mr. Putin leaves uh, the, um, the um, job of the president, if he leaves, which will happen in 2008, actually, in less than, in about a year from now. He will, of course, make sure that whoever succeeds him will be one of his crowd and will be 100% loyal and will be um, his man. But by the same token, Mr. Putin was put in this job as Yeltsin's man and the man of a group that surrounded Mr. Yeltsin, Boris Brezovsky included. And the first thing he did once he uh, was chosen and got to power as the, uh, the arch-loyal uh, disciple of the Yeltsin crowd. He distanced himself to Yeltsin and went uh, after the Yeltsin's entourage. So bec coming to power changed people. And if it so happens that Mr. Putin's successor uh, chooses uh, to distance himself from Mr. Putin and throw him to the wolves and his regime, that is the only possibility when uh, this whole puzzle would be resolved. Why Mr. Putin's successor would decide to do this, that depends on big politics. That depends first and foremost on what kind of pressure the outside world would apply on Russia. And that in turn depends on other issues, not only oil and gas, but Iran, Syria, energy supplies, <coughs> war on terror, and God knows <coughs> what. So it will be uh, the result of this very complex equation. Lady here. Maria Almendra McBride, USA, Hispanic, and Mexico. Uh, Mrs. Lietvenienko, as I told you before, the spirit of Sasha has touched the whole world's hearts, except for two people in Russia. <laughs> and um, they follow the story sincerely, and obviously the book is going to be very uh, valued. Um, how does your son feel about Russia now? How is Mr. Lietvenienko's lately at Benienko's, uh, the, his father, that we all saw through the cameras. And um, finally, would this polonium 210 um, endanger your life and your sons or your friends, like Mr. Goldford, who were in touch with Alexander, where is his soul? Thank you. OK, could be I start with last question? Because we are we are tested uh, after what happened. and. Anatoly wasn't uh, poisoned at all. He didn't have any polonium uh, in the first, and I hope not now. I, I was positively tested, but it wasn't dangerous for my short period of life, and nobody could tell me how it's really harmful for me in my future. Because it's not any knowledge about this, it's not any experience. It's me and all, we should wait 
what will happen, or I maybe have to be more serious about my health to check maybe properly. But it's not any advice, to be honest. I can say I'm still fine. I still good. I still fine. I'm okay. But again, it it shouldn't happen now, and nobody could tell me how it will be in the future. But um, Anatoly is now 13 years old. He's teenager, and now he started to be more and more as his father. He looks like his father. He started to do something very similar like his father. You know, it's just sometimes unbelievable how, without seeing him, he just copy him. But um, maybe he doesn't like to show his pain, probably like me sometimes. And of course, I don't like to ask him every time how does he feel. But uh, we, every time I speak with him about his father, he like in a way, what do you think if Sasha was happy now to see like this one, or do you think he will be happy to be in this place where we are now? And he reacts normally. You know, it means Sasha still be with us, with us every time in like positive way. And. Again, maybe first of all, he tried to be more support to me. He tried to be more man close to me. And it wasn't easy for him because he still be a boy. He's certain only. And maybe I did some mistake. I just like to tell him, actually, you're a man close to me. You need to be strong. But now I tried to tell him, just go your own way. You're a teenager. You can go to cinema to play with your friends. Just to be as normal as possible. It's what I'd like to say about this. Lady here. <clears throat> okay, a question to Marina. Um, what made Alexander Litvinenko leave Russia? He has worked for, he's chosen to work for FSB, and uh, it's not like he was totally naive to the way the services worked, but what was that one event that made him realize he had to go? Uh, actually, it's exactly what explained in the book. If you will read, you will understand exactly uh, what happened, why we decided to leave Russia. And of course, he wasn't naive. And he went to work to FSB because it was like a new organization. He went it on 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. And he joined a unit what uh, he was working against organized crime. It wasn't at all from a KGB. But first point to leave Russia for him, it was save his family. You know, what he did, he know what he did. It was dangerous way to say openly against FSB. And he knew it will be maybe not safe for us, but still it was safe for us. We were in Russia. But when it became dangerous, he decided to leave. Even when he took this decision, he didn't tell me about this. He just asked me to go for holiday. And when I was outside of Russia, he finally told me, Marina, you will not back to Russia. It was only reason for him. Just. Alex, perhaps you could just expand a little bit on that, on, yeah, uh, on, the, on, the, on the reasons why he, yes, in a sense, first um, had problems with the FSB, what well, they were asking him to do. It's, um, well, as I said, already Sasha got entangled in the uh, relationship between Putin and Berezovsky. And uh, Berezo uh, Putin was groomed by Yeltsin's circle to um, succeed Yeltsin as a counterbalance to FSB, remarkably, or to the, uh, I would say, the cabal of senior <coughs> FSB officers and senior military officers and conservatives and some old communist holdovers, holdovers uh, as a Yeltsin appointee to continue reforms Yeltsin style. Uh, so in this uh, development, uh, Putin very, uh, on a very short period of time came from the position of being a minor official in uh, the presidential administration to the position of the director of the FSB because of his past as a spy uh, many, many years ago, uh, and then to the position of prime minister and then to the position of president. 
So when uh, Putin was about to be appointed, uh, just before Putin was appointed the director of the FSB with the mandate to clean up uh, the system from Yeltsin, there was a scandal within FSB when a group of officers came out publicly, first internally and then publicly, accusing the older, uh, the previous FSB director of all kinds of wrongdoings, particularly extrajudicial uh, sanctions like assassinations and so on and so forth. There were several cases that this group of officers uh, uh, this, uh, exposed, and one of those cases was the plot of FSB to assassinate Berezovsky, who was one of the closest advisors of Yeltsin. So it was because of this expose, and Sasha was the ringleader of this group of officers, uh, that, Yeltsin, that Putin became the director of FSB back in, in, in 1998. So when Putin became the director of the FSB, in, uh, he did what was expected from him. He kind of streamlined the operation. But at the same time, he went against this group of whistleblowers because that was his way of winning the sympathy of the rank and file. Everybody in the FSB hated Litvinenko and his friends for speaking on TV. So Sasha Litvinenko ended up in prison in 1990 on charges which were thrown out by the court. But it was a false charges falsified by FSB, and he spent almost nine months in FSB prison before the court heard it, and he was charged again with another crime, and Berezovsky helped him to get out, I believe, uh, because by then Putin was already head of the FSB, and there was continuous process. Berezovsky was asking Putin why don't you do something for Sasha? After all, he helped you, you know, to get this job, and he said, I cannot do it. It will be misunderstood by the, uh, by the officers and uh, by the staff. And then he said, I'll do what I can. So eventually, Putin got Sasha out of prison, and then Putin became president. And, when Pu and Sasha was on bail, essentially, under this investigation. So when Putin became president, he clashed with Berezovsky over control of the Channel One TV network. Uh, Brezovsky owned uh, Channel One. Putin didn't like the coverage. It was a classic situation when the government and the owners uh, compete for editorial control. So in the end, Brezovsky had to flee abroad and was no longer able to protect Sasha. And he knew that he is doomed. And that's at that point they decided to run uh, to Turkey and then to uh, UK. But I just say why well, he'd like to save his family, because he started to receive uh, some in my address and even our son address, because it was saying, and me and our son will answer for what Sasha did. <coughs> he understood it was quite <coughs> dangerous and serious. My name is Adina Postelico and I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I have two questions. First, what makes you think that this case can be brought to court? And the second uh, is, what are, in your view, the links, the direct links, and kind of objective links, if you want, that can lead us to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Putin? Thank you. OK. As I said, I don't believe this case will be brought ever to court because the only suspect, Mr. Lugavoy, will name who is behind it. So, they, and, uh, if, so if this is Mr. Putin, he would never let this happen. So, um, however, the only possibility, as I mentioned, is that Mr. Putin's successor, for whatever reasons, will decide to go after Mr. Putin. Now, what makes us think that it was Mr. Putin, personally. Um, first of all, it's probably a consensus uh, among experts. If you just scan Western media or talk to specialists, uh, the consensus is that it's a government-sponsored job, that it's either rogue elements uh, or a job uh, by rogue elements in some government structure. That means without a government connection, you can't get hold of polonium. 
And this connection should be much higher than the FSB itself because it requires interdepartmental interaction. And um, so it should be a very, very high uh, level that uh, approved, uh, not to mention political, but simply structurally, the use of polonium for this particular operation. Now, so this is uh, where the objective elements evidence and now there is another objective element and that's the chemical and isotope analysis of polonium uh, recovered uh, from Sasha's body again expert will tell you that by judging the content of uh, uh, measuring the content of lead lead is the product of the composition of polonium and measuring the content of other isotopes in that material you can say uh, precisely on what day this polonium was produced and in what facility it was produced if you compare this sample with other batches of polonium available. Since Russia exports polonium in small amounts to various countries, I am sure that the law enforcement had obtained the samples and know uh, precisely on what day and what is the batch number of polonium that has been used to kill Sasha? And um, I believe that they, uh, uh, at that point, at this particular facility called Avangard Plant, former Russian weapons lab in uh, near um, near Gorky, uh, Arzama 16. Anyway, so this is the end of objective story. Now, why we believe it was Putin? Uh, number one. Uh, that or somebody very close to Putin. There is an episode described in the book which uh, demonstrates that uh, there is a real-time monitoring of uh, communications between everybody who is involved in Berezovsky's immediate circle with Moscow. Phone calls, emails, and so on not uh, recording when somebody records it and um, then analyzes it, but there is a team of people who are uh, sitting there listening in in real time and are uh, able to make decision what's important and what's not important and alert people in the Kremlin administration. This is the objective thing. There, were, uh, there is an episode in uh, the book described connected with the extradition hearings of Mr. Zakayev when we know it for a fact. So all uh, activities of the Brzezovsky circle is on, under personal control of Mr. Putin or people who are immediately uh, uh, sitting under him in the presidential administration. So that's the only objective uh, thing like I can say. And the last one is, of course, the motive. Nobody in Russia who had this power would have a motive, because simple rogue officers in the FSB who might have hated Litvinenko because he is one of their own who went to the West do not have this authority. And people on the higher up who have this authority are not emotional. They are rational. They're thinking about their money, their power, the, by their position in the hierarchy. The only person who displays emotion in the uh, group that is running Russia is Mr. Putin, because he has a personal thing here. Between him and Boris Brezovsky, there is a lot of bad blood personally. And the principal element of this personal thing is that the Brits refused to extradite Mr. Brzezovsky and Mr. Zakayev. This was a tremendous uh, blow to Mr. Putin's ego. Everybody else there don't have ego. They are really part of the structure. But he is a person with real feelings. And so the combination of this psychological analysis and hints lead us to believe that this is Mr. Putin personal, although I admit that it's not a definite proof and we'll never have any definite proof. It's just common sense. And the cover-up, of course. Look at uh, what they're doing now. Anybody? Well, I heard a lot from the left-hand side. Is anybody over here who want to speak? Maybe there. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, I've got um, two questions, really. Um, the first is to follow up on um, a previous question, which is, why is Lugovoy um, supposedly having brought the polonium and applied it? Why is he sitting in Moscow apparently entirely fit and healthy? Um, and either it's because you have to administer the, 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 the poison um, so that somebody actually eats or drinks it, in which case it wasn't, as the British have been saying, a danger to half of London. Um, or he didn't have to um, eat and drink it, in, in which case, why is, why is Lugovoy so healthy? Um, second question, um, in Lugovoy's press conference in Moscow, um, he gave, <laughs> sorry, um, in Lugovoy's press conference in Moscow, he gave um, quite detailed um, allegations about um, his own dealings with British Secret Service. And he claimed that Litvinenko had been working for the British Secret Service. Um, is that true? Okay. Alex, would you like to answer? All right. Question. Two questions. Question number one about why Lugavoy is still alive. Uh, well, who knows how he's healthy? Uh, well, let, Actually, yes. so let, us, uh, let us. Let uh, us. It's it's uh, science, so it's easy. That's easy. Uh, Secret Service is more difficult, but <laughs> science is easy. So. As I said uh, in the beginning, uh, polonium is totally harmless unless you ingest it because the radiation doesn't penetrate anything. So you have to swallow it or inhale it in order to get any health hazard. Now everything depends on the dose. If you get a big dose, uh, it's enough to uh, destroy your DNA, and after two weeks, while your body works uh, kind of uh, on inertia, then everything kind of falls down. That's what's happened with Sasha. If you get a smaller dose, the um, uh, delayed long-term effect of ingesting polonium, like being exposed to any radiation, you have increased incidence of cancer. And those people who are known to have died from polonium, starting with uh, Irene Curie, the daughter of Maria Curie, who died of polonium poisoning, and a couple of Israeli physicists who were exposed in their nuclear problem and so on, um, died of cancer with a delayed effect two, three, five years. So in that sense, uh, Mr. Lugavoy apparently didn't, if he had been uh, exposed to harmful dose, he obviously didn't know that he was using polonium. Nobody told him because otherwise he would have been more careful. Who Wait a minute. Uh, well, well, we don't know. No, we don't know. We don't know whether they were exposed or not, but I assume that they were exposed because people in that bar uh, who were standing, you know, quite afar. Uh, in Millennium Bar and in uh, the hotel, they were all tested positive by polonium because this thing has a tendency to fly in the air, in small doses, of course, not in uh, lethal doses. Now, the uh, one person who has been definitely exposed, let's say, secondhand, that means got it not from contact with polonium, but from contact with a person who had been in contact with polonium is Marina. She is our scientific reference point. Because Marina has been, she was never in contact with polonium. She was in contact with Sasha after he had ingested it. And she had reasonable levels uh, of polonium, which are not immediately harmful, and which increase the incidence of having cancer, let's say 5 or 10 or 20 years from now, by a few percent. That Doctors don't know, but th that's the only thing that she has. Now, she doesn't leave. She is the most who has been exposed to Sasha because for three first day, she was taking care of him at home while, before he was in the hospital. Her son, who was in the same apartment, didn't get any polonium. And Marina doesn't leave any traces. And nobody except Mr. Lugavoy and Mr. Kofton have left any traces. So what I am saying that Sasha could not have uh, contaminated Mr. Lugavoy and Mr. Kofton secondhand to the extent that they are leaving traces because she's not leaving any traces. 
That means that they were contaminated not because of contact with Sasha, but with, because of the direct contact with polonium. That's point one. Like people in the bar. So if they are contaminated, somebody was handling this polonium while they were all sitting at the table in the Millennium Bar or in Sushi Bar or wherever. Now, these two guys are leaving traces of polonium starting from October 16. Well, Sasha apparently was poisoned on November 1st. That is what, as we believe, leads the police to believe that there were two attempts. One on October 16 in the sushi bar on Piccadilly, which for some reason failed. That means Sasha didn't ingest anything. And the second one, which was successful on November 1st. Now, um, the Russians kind of say that it was Sasha who was handling polonium on October 16th in Sushi Bar, contaminated Lugavoy and Kaftun, and then they left all these traces starting from there, and then um, uh, somehow handled polonium again, <coughs> apparently on November 1st, and got uh, infected, him, uh, contaminate, uh, killed himself. So it's all, as you can see from up to this point, the matter of quantitative analysis. Since polonium is detectable in deletions a millionth of a millionth, that means Sasha got um, apparently um, something which is equivalent of to 20 micrograms of pure polonium. So if you dilute it a million times and then dilute it another million times, uh, you still can detect it with proper equipment. It's, uh, what is uh, the real forensic evidence is the amount of polonium found in those traces. Because if you touch it with the hand which was handling polonium, it's a million times more than if you kind of leave the same trace with the droplet of blood or of sweat because you have ingested it. And this is what we don't know. This is what the police knows. Uh, so <coughs> this answers in a nutshell uh, wh why they are alive and well. Obviously, they didn't get lethal dose. It's very likely that they go inhaled something just like people in the bar because the barman who served them Test po tested positives in the, in the um, Millennium Bar. Okay, the second question, and the, we, ha we simply have to wait until all this, sooner or later, this, all this evidence will become available, I'm sure, at the inquest level or wherever, whenever. But um, uh, the second question about the MI6, Mr. Lugavoy uh, or MI5 or both. Uh, Mr. Lugavoy uh, claimed in Moscow that he had been recruited by or, try, or an attempt was to recruit him with MI, uh, by MI6 in order to work for MX6 somehow with the help of Sasha Litvinenko. And that leads me to a little bit, can I say a little bit more because of it's, it's a very important issue. The first time we heard that uh, the Borisovsky circle is uh, working for the British uh, secret intelligence services was 2002. There is another uh, uh, former FSB officer, Mr. Tripashkin, who is serving term in Russia and who actually uh, last week won a case in the European court in human rights for inhumane uh, treatment, um, who uh, was arrested in 2003. And uh, to make a long st story short, he was arrested for poking his nose into the apartment bombings in Moscow in, 2000, in 1999. There were terrorist attacks in Moscow. It was used to start the war in Chechnya. There is a theory that these apartment bombings were staged by the Russian Secret Services, and Mr. Tripashkin was looking into this um, with um, you know, a certain degree of success and ended up in jail uh, and recognized universally as a political prisoner, even by the U.S. State Department, not to mention Amnesty International. Anyway, so in Mr. Tripashkin's indictment, there is a letter 
from FSB to the prosecutor service, dated 2002, which says that Mr. Berezovsky and Mr. Litvinenko have been recruited by the, that the FSB believes that Mr. Berezovsky and Mr. Litvinenko have been recruited by the British Secret Services, who in turn recruited Mr. Tripashkin in Moscow and charged him with looking into the apartment bombing, bombings in, uh, with the objective to tarnish the image of FSB and the Russian government. So this claim is not new. Uh, now it's resurfaced again. Uh, Mr. Lugovoy, of course, cannot be considered uh, a serious. Uh, you see, I have no way of knowing whether uh, MI6 or MI5 have recruited Mr. Lugovoy. I am absolutely sure that uh, MI6 and MI5 have not recruited Mr. Uh, Brzezowski or Mr. Uh, Litvinenko because they don't have much to offer. But, uh, very simple reason, uh, be, uh, but uh, I cannot exclude that, let's put it that way. I cannot exclude that uh, there is somehow behind this some interest or after all we're all not, uh, we're grown up people and these people work and they are around and so on. So what? Does it mean that uh, as Mr. Lugavoy suggested, MI6 staged uh, an act of nucle nuclear terrorist in the center of Lo London in order to kill one of their own? How does it logically fit to the whole thing? There's another guy who claims MI6 connection, Mr. Jarko, in Moscow, uh, who said that he was recruited by MI6 through uh, Berezovsky and Litvinenko, and who and you may know this, of course, because it's been a, a big thing in, in Russia. There's another guy in Moscow from former Brzezovsky's friends who says that MI6 have recruited him, but he's never passed any important information to them. But in the end, he decided to come clean. And um, so what? Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. I don't know. It, uh, it has nothing to do with the fact that uh, a big uh, dose of polonium was found in the middle of London uh, in, in, on the November 1st. Uh, lady there, just. <coughs> Why do you believe that uh, the Kremlin decided to strike then at that period of time and uh, was uh, Anna uh, Politkovskaya's uh, death Catalyst. You? Okay. Uh, there is a string of horrible crimes in Russia, right? Starting with apartment bombings in 1999 and ended, ending with Anna Politkovska. And there are several in between. A couple of people, more than a couple of people were killed. There is some strange information about the uh, terrorist attack on the theater, which was uncovered by Politkovska, and so on. And behind each of these events, there is a conspiracy theory, which attributes it to the Russian secret services. The major source of this, con one of the major sources of this conspiracy theories was Sasha Litvinenko. He never proved anything. He had good reasons uh, to argue that it might be all these events, ending with the killing of Politkovsky, as he said in this club, might have been the work of Russian secret services. There is no proof. It's just a string of events where Kremlin critics uh, die under suspicious circumstances, and it all. So I cannot tell you whether uh, Anna Politkovska killing has anything to do with Sasha's murder, or whether, uh, or, or otherwise. The only thing I can tell you is that when Ms. Politkovska was shot in Moscow, President Putin said, and I quote, the best I can, that some people who are hiding from our law enforcement in London wanted to find a sacrificial lamp to pin this murder on our government. He clearly insinuated, 
I, I don't, don't know whether it's exact quote, but this is what he said at the press conference in Germany, Putin, when he was asked about the murder of Politkovsky. He insinuated that this is Mr. Brizovsky or Mr. Zakayev, who are hiding from Russian law enforcement in England and are protected by English. They killed Anna Politkovsky in order to make life hard for Putin. So on that basis, I assume uh, that the motive of killing Sasha Litvinenko was to frame Berezovsky and Putin. Because if the president of Russia, uh, being who he is, stands up in front of the world press and says, Berezovsky and Zakayev killed Anna, Anna Politkovsky in order to harm me, that betrays a certain mindset. And this mindset works both ways. If he can believe that thing sincerely, he can develop the same sort of special operation. After all, he is a KGB operative. He's trained like this. So my, uh, there's no other rational explanation of killing Sasha Litvinenko. He was no threat. Uh, he was no, he's too low level to punish him at the level of Putin. So I believe personally that he was targeted in order to frame in the minds of British public opinion those people whom Putin has been trying to get for years. He failed to do this in legal, uh, by legal means, and he went after them in that way. Again, it assumes that nobody expected that polonium would have been found. Um, Too complex, but classes. I'm sorry that the, the whole thing is bizarre. Ginks Kobayashi for a Japanese newspaper. Uh, could you, this may be a rather uncomfortable question, but uh, could you explain your relationship with uh, Mr. Berzovsky? Because I was watching BBC 24 uh, hard talk, and uh, at some point the problems that you have been financially uh, helped by Mr. Berzovsky. Uh, so could you... Elaborate just a little bit more, please. And of course, Sasha was friend of Mr. Berezovsky. It was explained in this book exactly how it happened. And it still be very difficult to understand what it could be between these absolutely different people. This was very rich person and officer of FSB. But it actually was friendship. And Sasha were, was never em employed of Mr. Berezovsky in Russia, but when it was happened with us, he was the first person who supported us here. Because, of course, it wasn't easy to start absolutely no new life for us here in London. Even we never expect to have this new life. Nobody from us could speak English. We was without anything because we left all behind us. And we received grant from foundation who organized is Mr. Berezovsky. It can't say directly from him, but actually it was from him. And after what happened last November, I received this help again. And I just can say thank you very much for this help. If I may add a little bit, because the Berezovsky factor uh, and this question, of course, opens the whole line of questioning f who is Mr. Berezovsky and why uh, and whether the association with him in any way, let's say, undermines the whole reasoning. I would say on the contrary. Uh, so let me, since I am speaking for Mr. Brezovsky because I am his employee, besides being Sasha's uh, friend, I uh, getting salary from Mr. Brezovsky, so, uh, uh, so you can take it from me. Uh, the, um, this is the way I view it. Uh, Mr. Berezovsky is one of a group of people who get immensely rich under Yeltsin through uh, privatization of state assets, which happened in mid-90s. He's not the richest of them. Uh, uh, he is uh, not the poorest of them. He is, uh, if you take the list of Russian dollar billionaires, number one is, of course, Roman Abramovich, and Brzezovsky is probably, the, today, is somewhere number 25, 
I don't know. It's somewhere between 20 and 30. Uh, so there are three oligarchs, so-called oligarchs, who, after Putin came to power, came into, uh, ended up in conflict with Mr. Putin. Mr. Brzezovsky and Mr. Gusinski, which essentially was uh, about uh, control of mass media, because each of them owned a major channel, uh, TV channel. So when the government started to put uh, TV under control, they clashed with the owners, and uh, Mr. Brzezovsky and Mr. Gusinski ended up in London and New York, respectively. And Mr. Khodorkovsky, who uh, was the richest man of Russia and the owner of the Yukos oil company, who is now in jail, primarily because he uh, supported uh, opposition parties and had his own political ambitions. So since Mr. Be uh, the everybody else is kind of pretty uh, fine, like Mr. Abramovich is obviously the best example, but there are others like him. Uh, they're very, very, uh, on very good terms with the Kremlin and, it's pr and uh, uh, Mr. Derry Pasca recently, the owner of Russian Aluminum, who um, is number two in the list of richest men uh, in Russia, recently said, it was very well reported, that he doesn't consider his money his own, <laughs> essentially. He thinks that uh, if, uh, it's only for the asking. He's worth approximately 10 billion pounds. So he said, if, if the state asks me to give all my money to the states, I will do it tomorrow. It's just a matter of asking. I'm just a caretaker of the government money. So that was the, uh, probably one of the reasons why three of some 20 oligarchs decided to uh, fight for whatever they had, while they had everybody else kind of uh, obliged. Now, I come from an uh, old school of dissidents, uh, in the, uh, and I live in the West for 30 years, and I can only say that thank God that there are three oligarchs who are willing to take, uh, put their fortune, sizable amount of their fortune, for whatever reasons, to support other people who risk their life and their freedom to fight this regime. In the old days, when we were uh, back uh, in Brezhnev time, when we were uh, opposing uh, the Soviet government, there was an industry here funded by hundreds of millions of dollars of government money supporting dissidents from Sakharov to Solzhenitsyn to everybody else. Those who are old enough remember those days. There were programs and uh, radio broadcasts and academic centers and stipends and spies and God, you know, National Endowment for Democracy, God knows what. And we felt this because we knew that we have. Now there's nothing. The Western government stopped all support of democracy in uh, the former Soviet Union, particularly the United States government and the European community. Private, co private foundations left the scene. And if not for the money from these three people uh, and some private Western foundations, it will be a totally, totally, completely complete silence in uh, uh, the former Soviet Union. So the only thing, I don't know why Mr. No, I know why Mr. Berezovsky is doing it, but let's say I don't know. But the fact that over the past um, seven years, six years, six and a half years since he left, he spent approximately $100 million, to my knowledge, uh, in support of various um, uh, initiatives uh, resisting Russian uh, government. I think it's a blessing, and I think if there were more people like this, it would be very, very good, including, of course, this small circle of London-based dissidents and Sasha Litvinenko. Alex, um, <coughs> would you mind just um, very briefly maybe explaining for people here who don't fully understand it, um, um, Mr. Ber Berezovsky's role actually at the beginning of things where he was able to, in a sense, to promote um, uh, Vladimir Putin and how he was a champion of Putin in a sense. Um, can, you, can you explain that to people? Because I think it makes, in, in a sense, his fall a lot more, more dramatic. Well, what happened is that uh, Mr. Berezovsky was what they called the grey eminence of the Kremlin during Yeltsin's years. 
he, of course, was not the major beneficiary of the privatization uh, of major government essence, but he was the most active of them. Uh, and uh, he uh, actually rallied uh, all these oligarchs. Uh, in 1996 behind Yeltsin against communists and you and they used their money uh, to actually fund Yeltsin's re-election campaign when he went for the second term. When Yeltsin was coming to the end of his uh, second term, um, the situation in Russia was extremely, I, w I didn't work for Brezovsky then so I'm an observer. I started working for him after he came here. So uh, at that time, uh, there was a fear among the reformer camp, that is, uh, the people in the Kremlin, and uh, those who uh, championed privatization and returned to the uh, kind of uh, capitalist way, whatever it was at that time, that the communists would win the election. And the uh, champion of uh, this uh, revanchist uh, group was the presidential uh, candidate by the name of um, Evgeny Primakov, who was at the time Russian prime minister. And previously, he was the head of Russian foreign intelligence. And he was perceived uh, by everybody as the uh, classic KGB guy. And he said that he's, this is exactly what he is going to do if he becomes the president. He will put oligarchs in jail. He will, to a large extent, reverse privatization. That means bring back the strategic assets under state control. He would reintroduce censorship of the media. And he will essentially take the middle line between what was under Yeltsin and uh, what was before in the old Soviet times. And he was perceived by everybody as a holdover of the old communist, of the Politburo. And he didn't make any uh, actually secret of what his plans are. So Yeltsin's camp was frantically looking for somebody who would beat Primakov. And it was Putin. He was chosen as somebody who is very loyal to Yeltsin and to this group of people. They called it family. And again, I'm not passing judgments here. I'm saying, I'm just stating the historic uh, truth. And, prim and Putin was picked by Yeltsin's close circle, which included Yeltsin's daughter, Yeltsin's son-in-law, Yeltsin's key ministers, key oligarchs, and Berezovsky, who was kind of uh, very influential in that circle, to uh, stand up to Primakov, who declared that he will restore the Soviet system, essentially, in effect. And they used everything in their disposal, uh, primarily money and control of the media, of these oligarchs, because oligarchs owned uh, major ch TV channels, to beat Primakov at the polls. And Putin became president. And the first thing that Putin did when he became president, he suddenly changed colors and started doing exactly what Primakov was promising. Maybe it was populist, maybe it was his loyalty to his uh, system, but that's why I said it's a Shakespearean situation, because it's tremendous power, tremendous money, and, um, and so Berezovsky had to flee, Khodorkovsky went to jail, and all other oligarchs um, kind of uh, stopped uh, being independent. And as a byproduct, we have no free media, we have tremendous nationalism and xenophobia in Russia, we have um, a reassertion of the <coughs> global claims of global, uh, of global uh, significance with oil and gas. We have, again, and then now I'm giving you the uh, propaganda. We have arms to Syria. We have uh, support of Iran. We have uh, gas blackmail and so on and so forth. So it's again, it's, uh, it's, I'm not passing value judgments. I'm just explaining what has happened in Russia. And Brzezovsky, yes, he helped to put this guy in place, and then he had to flee. You received from Putin all what you had waited from Primakov. It is true? Yes. 
No. Well, 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 yeah, just, just a minute, just a minute. Oh. Okay, can you go through the chair, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are getting towards the end it's of the allotted time, I believe. We are. Uh, one or two more quick questions, if you don't mind. Thank you. Maybe there. Good evening. Um, I'm a freelance journalist for a Canadian newspaper. Um, I have two questions on a more personal note for Marina. Um, first of all, I hope this won't be too difficult for you to answer. Um, what do you miss most about your husband? And second of all, <clears throat> excuse me, are you afraid for your safety? Are you afraid um, for your health, for your son's uh, safety? Because you're speaking out and you're publishing a book and... Uh, what I'm speaking about usually, of course, is my private life and what I lost finally, my friend, my husband and my love. And I, I don't feel unsafe here. Even what then happened with Sasha, he never felt unsafe as well. And I still safe here. No, even I was asking, would you like to go maybe as a country to be? I said, no, I, I feel safe. I still safe here. And more now, after what I received from British government. But of course, it's very personal to say what I miss more, particularly to say in front of audience where is men and women. But to be honest to say, I was very confident woman with my husband. He was very faithful. He was Maybe not easy life with him, but I ex accepted when I was married with him. And was very happy life with him because I, it was my half. You know, when one day you understand, you find it your half. It's exactly what you're looking for all your life. It just helped. I still feel he's here. One more question, very briefly. I beg your pardon. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you should have jabbed me in the back. Yes, my name is Andros Wydyski from Polish News Agency. Uh, there was a theory um, put forward that uh, Litvinenko was doing private research for British companies and got uh, involved with Russian mafia and that somehow he, um, he was in conflict with powerful mafia interests. Uh, would you like to comment on that? Actually, it's very, very difficult to comment. Of course, Sasha was a very professional man. And what he did before in Russia, and maybe he still be in England. Because, and he every time said, I can't do any other job because I'm very professional in this way. And when he received question to help, to consult, of course, he could say many things about Russian mafia, about these people. and. Even he concerned mafia became, uh, started to rule Russia even. And it started to be a big problem, not just for Russia and for many European countries. And actually what he concerned about, uh, even it could spoil England as well. And what he could do, he could, but I can't say is conflict or not. And, but of course he got something, uh, inquiry, but if I may add, uh, what, we know, what I know about Sasha, Sasha's uh, activities in that area, he, he, all his life he worked in the organized crime division back in Russia. Uh, and uh, he was, of course, a professional. You could tell it by just uh, whatever else he was, but he knew those, this world very well, the world of Russian organized crime. And on the second year of, uh, third year, second, third year of his life here, he started consulting uh, first private uh, British companies. I wouldn't name them, but you can find them on the internet um, uh, here uh, in the area of security. Uh, I know, for example, that he helped one of this private security company, uh, consulted them when a British businessman was kidnapped in Georgia, in the Caucasus, he helped resolve that situation back in 2002, and so on. 
I think that he also worked with uh, law enforcement in various European countries. That means with the police. Because he, uh, in the past, in the last two years of his life, he used to travel. He went to different countries. I know uh, from him that he went to Spain, for example, to, and then as a consultant for the Spanish police to uh, uh, help them with some Russian underworld uh, penetration of Spain. Uh, but he never worked for them as an officer. He was an outside consultant. And uh, actually, when we reduced, as a Brzezowski Foundation, his uh, grant, his support in the last two years of his life, that was because about half of his income came from this private consulting in the security area. So I can imagine that there may be some uh, crime figures who were not happy with him. But the level of the issues he was dealing with, you know, kidnapping of the businessmen, drug, uh, drug, uh, drugs, you know, maybe uh, whatever uh, mafia is doing, you know, human trafficking, would not explain Polonium and the um, sophistication of the operation, and Mr. Lugovoy was not mafia. Mr. Lugovoy would have been paid at least $30 million to pull this off, because he was worth $30 million. Uh, why would he do this for mafia? Thank you very much. Um, well, I think everybody in this room will agree it's been quite an extraordinary uh, meeting. I'd like you to show your appreciation for our two speakers tonight, in particular, to Marina, this is the first time that she's spoken in public in this country, and I, I think we'll all, uh, we all have to agree it's been a very moving experience listening to her talk. Um, thank you very much for coming along tonight and supporting the Frontline Club, and we hope to see you at our future events. So please put your hands together. <laughs> for our